All right, so in this video, we're going to look at blood, which is chapter 17. And uh, the reason why we have blood having its own chapter is that it's, it's complex enough, and there's enough detail here where we can talk about it in its own separate chapter. Uh, we talked about blood a little bit going back to uh, AMP1 because we said that blood was a connective tissue, right? In fact, it's a fluid connective tissue. And the reason why uh, blood is classified as a connective tissue, it's got the three elements that all connective tissues have. That's cells, fibers, and ground substance, right? So the cells of blood would be like your erythrocytes or red blood cells, your leukocytes or white blood cells, and then platelets. The ground substance of blood, which is the fluid component, that's blood plasma. So blood plasma is like the watery part of blood, right? And then the fibers that are in blood are actually dissolved within plasma. And so you find the fibers dissolved and soluble within their blood plasma in the form of what's called fibrinogen. <clears throat> so when blood's a fluid, the fibers are dissolved. But when blood clots and becomes a solid, those fibers actually clump together and they form this like network, this mesh, that basically turns blood into a solid. So what's kind of cool then is that blood is a connective tissue and it's called this not just because it has those three elements, but also because it comes from mesenchyme, like all connective tissues do. So remember, it has those three major components there. So if we, if we can study blood, usually the way we do this, you guys, is you'll take out a sample of blood. You know, like in lab, we just did a little bit of, uh, you know, like the, the Lancet, and we used several drops of blood to look at this kind of stuff. But if you wanted to really study blood, you know, you could take out a pretty fairly sizable volume of it, you know, maybe 10 milliliters or so. I think maybe we were working with about a mil or two mils when we used our little capillary tubes, right? But this is obviously a larger test tube or vial. And so uh, when you... When you extract that blood and maybe put it into a test tube. We call that whole blood. So whole blood is basically just blood in its just natural form or state, right? But the problem with, with just looking at whole blood is you can't really see the individual components as they would be separated, right? So what we can do then is actually take whole blood, put it into a centrifuge, and what a centrifuge does is it spins really quickly. And because it spins quickly, it actually amplifies like, you know, gravity, right? We're saying that get some g-force there. And so uh, what's really cool is these centrifuges kind of operate on the order of like thousands of g's, right? Like thousands of times the normal force of gravity. And what that does by applying all that force is it separates the components by mass. So what you find is after you spin down the blood, the red blood cells sink to the bottom because they're the heaviest, because they're full of protein. Then we, we call that the, the, um, the erythrocytes. Then in the middle here, we get, we get what's called a buffy coat. The buffy coat is just your white blood cells and your platelets. And then above that, we have blood plasma. So all this kind of urine-colored or straw-colored clear solution is blood plasma. And that accounts for like 55% or, or so of your normal blood volume, right? Now, um, it's the least dense component. That's why it floats to the top, okay? Because it's mostly water. It's like 99% water. So um, if you guys look down here... This is all, all these formed elements right here. This is what we call hematocrits. So hematocrit are the formed elements of blood. Now there's an anatomical definition and there's a clinical definition of hematocrit. The anatomical definition of hematocrit, um, we're saying, would be uh, all of your formed elements. And then the clinical definition is basically uh, just your red blood cells. And they're basically the same thing, you guys, because this buffy coat accounts for less than 1% of your total blood volume. So it doesn't really contribute a lot to like you know how we calculate hematocrit or uh, blood volume for that matter, because if you if you guys actually have seen a blood buffy coat before, when you spin it down, it looks like a dusting of white cells right on the surface of those red blood cells in the tube. There's really not that many there, so they're kind of hard to identify. So when you think about like the characteristics of blood, we see it's like a sticky, opaque fluid with a metallic taste. You might wonder, okay, well, why do we care to mention that it has a metallic taste? Well, you know, like if a patient claims that they can taste, you know, metallic sort of taste in their mouth, it, it could be because they have a bleed, right? Uh, it could be from other reasons as well. But what gives blood its metallic taste is the fact that it's full of iron, right? And the iron that's in blood, you actually find within hemoglobin, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Now, what's kind of cool about blood, too, is that its color varies on the uh, concentration of oxygen that's in that blood, and how much oxygen is actually bound to hemoglobin. So I think we talked about this a little bit, going back to that oxygen-hemoglobin dissociation curve. 
because we said you can use a pulse oximeter, right, the pulse ox, on your fingernail, and what that does is it shines a light through your fingernail, and then it, that light gets reflected back into a sensor in the device, right? Well, the reflected light is going to change based on the color of the blood, and the color of the blood changes based on its O2 content. So if you're measuring the reflectance of that light from the finger, the color of the light that's reflected also is based off of how much O2 is in the blood, or rather oxygen saturation or hemoglobin, to be more precise. And so what's kind of cool then is that if your blood has a lot of O2, it's more of like a scarlet red, and if it's low O2, it's just like a darker red, you know. Um, so it's just varies, variations of shades of red. There's no such thing as blue blood in humans, at least, right? There are other organisms on Earth that have blue blood, like horseshoe crabs, right? But humans just have red blood. <coughs> Excuse me. But the reason why our vessels can look blue is that it's the blue wavelengths of light that can make it through our skin, right? So even though the blood is red... It's the bluish wavelengths of light that can make it through skin, so it makes it look like there's blue things in there, right? But it, that's not really the case. It's actually red, right? So the normal pH of blood is 7.35 to 7.45. And we already talked about the three, line, the three lines of defense for pH regulation. We said the first line of defense was buffers, like bicarbonate. Then we said the second line of defense was your respiratory system because you can help breathe out CO2 or maybe not breathe as quickly to help accumulate CO2. Uh, and your third line of defense is your kidneys. So your kidneys can also handle acids and bases um, to help keep you within this narrow range of blood pH. And what's kind of cool too, you guys, is that on average, your blood accounts for about 8% of your body's weight. But your average blood volume, if you're male or female, is right around 5 liters or so. Right? It's going to vary around that. It could be more, maybe less, but right around 5 liters. So you're saying 5 to 6 for males, 4 to 5 for females. So that's why I just say 5 in general. Okay, so um, five liters is not a whole lot, right? If I don't have my water bottle with me today, but like your, your REI green one, that's about a liter, right? So it means that we would only have about five of those liters in our body, which is just like a standard water bottle size. So not a lot of blood there, right? Which means that if you're losing a lot of blood, uh, you don't have a lot to spare, unfortunately, right? Now, when they talk about administering units of blood, the units are in liters, right? So if you say like, oh, you know, a patient got four, four units of blood. That means they, they were administered four liters of blood, which could be almost their entire blood volume, right? And so it's kind of interesting. Now, in terms of the functions of blood, we know that one of its major functions is distribution, right? Not just distribution of nutrients like O2, but also distribution of wastes. So it's blood that picks up wastes from tissues and then carries that to the organs that help to eliminate those wastes, right? Um, blood's also involved with transporting hormones, which we talked about. In fact, that's what defines hormones is they're transportable through, blood, through the bloodstream. And so uh, it also helps regulate body temperature because it helps distribute heat throughout your body. So if heat is generated more so like in your muscles because you're physically active, then your blood can carry that heat away from muscles and bring that to other areas of the body to kind of more even out your body temperature, if that makes sense. Okay. Now, we know that blood also helps to regulate blood pH, which sounds weird. Like, how can blood regulate its own pH? Well, there are chemicals in blood that act as chemical buffers, right? So you have bicarbonate ion, which comes from carbonic acid. Uh, you also have protein buffers like albumin that can also help maintain normal blood pH, okay? So um, your blood also maintains adequate fluid volume in your blood. And this sounds kind of weird, you guys, but your blood can maintain its own volume. And the reason being is that, remember, 55% of blood is plasma, which is mostly water. And so there are things that are in blood that can attract and hold onto water. That way you're not just losing water in your tissues. So it keeps it in the blood, right? And so um, that would be like albumin, which attracts and holds onto that water. So basically it maintains its own volume, which is pretty cool, to a point, obviously. So other protective functions, you guys, we know that blood prevents blood loss. And the way this works is if you rupture a vessel where your vessel could potentially start losing blood through that ruptured wall, what blood can do then is clot and block that vessel, and it prevents further blood loss by forming that clot, right? So blood prevents blood loss. And it also prevents infection. There are lots of antimicrobial products in blood, right? So we have you know, white blood cells or leukocytes. Uh, we got complement proteins, which are made by your liver. And we'll talk about these more so in the immunology chapter. 
but complement proteins are involved in blood clotting and immune defense. For immune defense, they actually can punch holes in foreign cells, which is pretty awesome. Okay? Um, and then we also have antibodies. And antibodies are like little molecular flags that can stick onto foreign um, antigens, you know, like maybe a different blood type. And that can actually not only cause those microbes to clump up, which makes them easier for the removal, but it can also act activate complement. And we'll talk about that some more too when we get to the immunology chapter. So for blood plasma, you guys, we say it's 90% water vo by volume or weight. Actually, I'm not sure what that is. Maybe it's, maybe it's, it's probably weight actually. 90% volume, 90% uh, water by weight, not volume. So uh, in plasma though, we find lots of dissolved solutes like nutrients and gases and hormones and waste and proteins and inorganic ions. So this is what we talk about as being like serum, right? So if you hear about like serum transfer, serum, you know, getting blood plasma transfer, that's basically the watery component of blood and it's full of these things. Um, so including hormones and different nutrients and gases. And what we find though, you guys, is that of all the solutes in plasma, of all the dissolved things that are in plasma, proteins are the, the most abundant, okay? So you find a lot of protein in blood plasma. Now, of all those proteins, the most abundant one is called albumin. And, what, and we'll talk about albumin here in a minute. But it accounts for 60% of, of, the, of the weight of that, of that uh, you know, component of blood or plasma. And then it's followed by globulins. And globulins would be like aminoglobulins, like antibodies. And then 4% is fibrinogen, okay? Now, if you think about this word, Fibrin. What does that sound like? Fibrin. Fibers. Yeah, exactly. Good. And then we talk about ogen. What if, if, a, if a word ends in ogen in biology? Is that active or inactive? Inactive, right? Remember we talked about like pepsin, ogen? That's the inactive form of pepsin. So fibrin, ogen are the inactive fibers of blood, right? So remember how I said that, remember blood's a connective tissue because it has fibers. But when blood's a fluid, those fibers are dissolved. And so when we say that the fibers are dissolved, they're in their fibrinogen states, which makes them dissolvable, okay? So when we talk about blood clotting here later, we'll, we'll say that fibrinogen is actually converted to fibrin, which then turns into this mesh, and that, that allows for clotting to occur. So uh, most of those, by the way, most of these plasma proteins are made by your liver. So if you have liver failure, then you can actually lack a sufficient amount of these proteins for things like blood clotting, immune defense, and even holding on to your own body water, okay? So let's talk about albumin first. Of, if, if this is the most abundant of all the plasma proteins, 60% of it, um, <clears throat> it's also in a, in a lot of ways one of the most important, at least in terms of maintaining blood volume, because it does carry certain substances, like albumin can carry certain hormones throughout your bloodstream. Remember how we said that certain hormones that were like lipid soluble needed a binding globulin to, to carry those? or some sort of transport protein to make them soluble in water. So albumin is one of those. Albumin is also a, ke a chemical buffer, but specifically a protein buffer. So albumin can actually help, help also maintain normal blood pH. Okay? And then we also find, you guys, that the major, that's the, the most, one of the most important functions of albumin is it's the most important contributor to what we call blood osmotic pressure. So if you guys remember, <clears throat> osmosis was movement of water, right? In fact, it was water diffusion. But what we said for osmosis is that water follows solutes, right? So if my body is the albumin molecule, then I can attract water because water is going to go from an area of low, I'm sorry, high water concentration to low water concentration where there's more solutes. So water moves towards the solutes. So what albumin does, you guys, is that by exerting this plasma osmotic pressure, it's essentially attracting water into blood. But the reason why this is important is if you didn't have this protein, your blood plasma water could potentially leak out of your blood into your tissues because some of your smaller vessels are kind of leaky. And if you didn't have this protein to hold on to the water, your blood would effectively dehydrate by losing water into your tissues. So this is an extremely important protein. And the reason being is it attracts water and it holds that water inside your blood. Okay. So if you don't make this protein, what do you guys think happens then? So if you didn't make enough albumin because like you had, your liver was failing, what do you guys think would happen to your blood? You'd have water loss, good. And so where would the water be going if you're losing it from blood? In the tissues, right? You guys know what that looks like when you lose water in the tissues? What's that, what do we call that? Edema, right? Which is swelling. 
So what you find, you guys, if you don't have enough albumin, you get pretty significant edema. And this can occur in the distal extremities and even the abdominal cavity too. So it's kind of interesting. So for the formed elements, you guys, uh, we talk about these as being the cellular components of blood, right? So the formed elements would be like your white blood cells, aka leukocytes, your red blood cells or erythrocytes, and then your platelets. But the only true cell of all three of those are the leukocytes or white blood cells because those are the only ones that actually have a nucleus. So red blood cells don't have a nucleus. They actually lose their nucleus while they're developing. And then platelets aren't even close to being a true cell because they're just little pieces of cells that kind of fragment off, okay? So uh, most of these formed elements, you guys, only survive in the bloodstream for several days. The platelets, several days. Even leukocytes or white blood cells, also many of those are only several days. The longest living one of, of those formed elements, at least not, maybe not the longest, but one of the longest, is um, <clears throat> red blood cells or erythrocytes, okay? They can last about 90 to 120 days on average, right? So about three or four months, which in, honestly isn't that long as far as cells are concerned, right? Like your brain cells live with you throughout your whole life, whereas your red blood cells are replaced several times a year, right? So it's kind of interesting. Now these blood cells originate from bone marrow, and they actually don't divide once they're formed, right? Like you can't have a red blood cell turn into more red blood cells. But all these formed elements come from bone marrow cells called the hemocytoblasts, which are basically stem cells that can give rise to any blood cell. Okay, so all the leukocytes, the red blood cells, and even the platelets, they all come from these bone marrow cells. Okay, so if you guys look at a blood smear then here, I like to say smear, I don't know why. <laughs> a blood smear, we see white blood cells here, right? And we can identify those because they have nuclei, which makes sense. You see a big old nucleus here. Those are leukocytes. We also see red blood cells, right, these ones. And you can tell they don't have a nucleus. And the reason why you see that they don't have a nucleus is, well, they, even the centers of those cells look kind of clear, right? Now, it's not like they have a hole in the middle, although it looks like that, like that. It's just that they don't have a nucleus to absorb light, so the center of the cell looks more clear, right? So red blood cells don't have a nucleus, which means they can't repair themselves because they don't have genes to make new protein, right? And so that means that red blood cells are really just bags of protein, specifically hemoglobin, right? And the reason why they're red is because of the hemoglobin. It has kind of a reddish hue to it, right? So the platelets here, I always say, kind of look like some schmutz on the slide, right? So if it looks like just a little bit of like dirt or something got on the slide, that's a platelet, right? And so what's kind of interesting too, guys, is that platelets used to be called thrombocytes. A thrombus is a clot. So they said that platelets were clot cells or thrombocytes because, <clears throat> you know, they kind of look spherical. They kind of look like a cell-ish. But what, what, as we started studying platelets more so, we started to realize that, uh, that they actually aren't a true cell. So they stopped calling them thrombocytes and just started calling them platelets, right? They're just little pieces of a cell, like lits, right? Like uh, pieces. But, in, but it, clinically, people still call them thrombocytes. So like the clinical world hasn't caught up with that new, new word, right? So in like clinical medicine, you're going to hear about words like thrombocytosis or thrombocytopenia. <clears throat> that relates to blood platelets. But they don't use the word platelet. They still use the word thrombocyte, which is a misnomer because it's not really a true cell. Okay, So kind of keep that in mind. So with the erythrocytes, you guys, or red blood cells, we say that they're biconcave discs. So they come together and they kind of form this, uh, it's almost like a donut without the hole. So it's, it's, like, it's almost like someone formed a donut, but the hole wasn't complete. So it just kind of forms two divots on either side. right? So we say it's a biconcave disc. It's a nucleus, so it doesn't have a nucleus. There's no organelles, no mitochondria, so it undergoes anaerobic respiration. In fact, it relies on glycolysis to produce enough ATP to power its sodium potassium pumps. Okay? So um, what's interesting too about these red blood cells, you guys, is that their diameter is usually slightly larger than even your smallest uh, capillaries, your blood vessels in your body, which means that your red blood cells have to be bendable and flexible to squeeze through those really small vessels, okay? Now, they're full of hemoglobin. That's why I was saying that red blood cells are like big old bags of hemoglobin. So 97% of the sort of the weight inside of that red blood cell is due to hemoglobin, <clears throat> which is an important protein. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, it also contains other plasma membrane proteins like spectrin, which provides some flexibility for its shape. Now, <clears throat> one thing that's important to note to you guys is that 
red blood cells contribute to the viscosity of blood. Viscosity is the resistance of flow, right? And so if you have more red blood cells, your blood is more sticky and more resistant to flow. If you have less red blood cells, then your blood is more watery and can flow easier. And this is actually why you don't want too many red blood cells in your blood, right? So if you guys remember, our normal hematocrit of whole blood was like 45% or so. If you had like 60% hematocrit, right, where you're saying that it's basically like, you know, a lot more red blood cells, your blood is going to be more sticky. It's going to be more viscous. It's going to be more resistant to flow, which means your heart is going to have to work harder to pump that blood. It's like trying to pump like a thicker solution through a tube. It's going to be way harder to pump that, right? So uh, that's important to note. Keep that in mind, you guys, because we're going to come back to uh, red blood cell fraction as a way to talk about resistance in blood pressure. So when we get to blood pressure regulation, you got to remember that red blood cell counts, or sort of the fraction of the volume, accounts for blood viscosity. So your blood becomes more sticky if you have more red blood cells, and more watery and less sticky if you have less red blood cells. Keep that in mind, right? But remember, it's, it's also just a fraction. So if you're dehydrated and you have less plasma, what does that mean you have more of? More red blood cells. You got it. So as your as your blood dehydrates, it also becomes more viscous and more resistant to flow. And so dehydration also can put extra stress on your heart to pump that more viscous blood. And by sticky, you guys, I mean it's not literally that sticky. It's just going to be slightly more viscous than if it had normal amounts of plasma. But it's just a way to like dramatically talk about it. You know what I mean? It's not going to be like molasses kind of thing. But it'll be a little bit more more viscous. Okay, so <clears throat> if you guys look at a red blood cell here. We can see it's got that biconcave disc shape here. So it's a side view. This is sort of a top view. And you guys see that the middle is pretty thin and the sides are wider. Now the reason for this is that it allows for some bendability and some flexibility. But you also might wonder, well, why aren't they just like a sphere like other cells, right? Like why aren't they just circular and spherical like other blood cells? Well, by having this biconcave disc shape, it actually increases the surface area of a red blood cell. So why would you want to have more surface area on this red blood cell? What do you guys think? Maybe you can fit more of them in an area. You can fit more hemoglobin on the inside, right? But when you think of think about back to the lungs, you guys. What was the importance of having a lot of surface area in the lungs? What was that for? If you have lots of alveoli and surface area in there, and you don't want extra surface area in your lungs, because then you get better that's a gas exchange, right? So, <clears throat> are gases moving in and out of these red blood cells? Absolutely, right? Because they have, they're full of hemoglobin, which holds on to oxygen and CO2. So, <clears throat> kind of like the lungs, by having more surface area on this red blood cell, O2 and CO2 can enter and exit this red blood cell more readily because there's more surface area. There's more space for the gases to enter and exit. Okay. So, if you guys look here at hemoglobin, um, <clears throat> what's kind of cool is that every single red blood cell is, has about 250 million molecules of hemoglobin or so, right? So uh, we're saying that those red blood cells are full of hemoglobin. There's a lot of it, okay? And each hemoglobin molecule is made of four globin chains. So you have the beta chains and the alpha chains, and each uh, protein chain has a heme group in the middle. And heme is this kind of complex <clears throat> organic molecule or carbon containing molecule <clears throat> excuse me and the reason why it's important to note is that in the center of each heme you find a central iron atom so you guys see that fe there so that the central iron atom that's held there by the heme group is actually what associates with o2 and co2 and that kind of stuff right because it actually can form kind of a weak bond with those gases and so uh, that's the heme group here now remember heme can be converted into bilirubin, and bilirubin is what gives bile the green color, right? When it's in blood, we call it, you know, hemoglobin, and it's essentially red, but when it's in bile, it's bilirubin, and it's green. So it's kind of interesting how you can go from a red-colored thing to a green-colored thing, but it's essentially a very similar molecule, but it's something to keep in mind, and it's important to note that red blood cells are recycled and then sort of, uh, you know, uh, placed into, you know, bile as a way to use it, reuse those, if that makes sense. Okay, so 
if your red blood cells only last about 90 to 120 days or so, that means you have to continually produce new ones, right? And so this comes from what we call hematopoietic stem cells. So we also call these the hemocytoblasts. And these give rise to all of the formed elements, right? So if you guys remember the formed elements were your white blood cells, your red blood cells, and your platelets. And so you find these in red bone marrow, and their function is essentially to, you know, make new blood cells. So you have one type of hemocytoblast, and that can divide into other cells that can turn into all of your leukocytes, your red blood cells, even your platelets, which is actually pretty cool. And you find these in red bone marrow. You guys remember, in adults, Red bone marrow is only found in, in several kind of key areas, right? You find that in your sternum, the proximal epiphyses of your humerus and your femur, your hip bones, your oscoxa, your clavicles, your vertebra, and your cranial bones. But that's about it, right? So pretty much the rest of your long bones of your body, if it's not the proximal epiphyses of your femur and humerus, it won't have red marrow. It's going to have mostly red marrow, right? But what's kind of cool, though, is that – I'm sorry, uh, did I say red marrow? It will have red marrow – in those key areas, otherwise it'll be yellow marrow, which is mostly fat. Okay, cool. <laughs> now, what's kind of cool though is that yellow marrow can turn back into red marrow uh, if you have a lot of blood loss or something, which is kind of cool. Okay, so um, what's interesting though, you guys, once you create these cells, they can't change, right? So once they're committed to being a leukocyte, it's not like these cells can go back and then turn into a red blood cell, okay? Once they're committed, that's what they are, okay? So, <clears throat> which is kind of cool because that's not like what we do, right? Like if, if humans can kind of like become things, you know, like you're like, oh, I'm going to become a nurse or I'm going to become whatever. You know, you're not committed to that. Like you can always maybe go back and become something else too, which is really kind of cool, you know. So you're not stuck with that. Uh, so uh, anyways, stem cells here, you guys, like we, we call these the hemocytoblasts, a.k.a. hematopoietic stem cell. The reason why they're called hematopoietic, well, hemato is blood. Poetic means to create. So the hematopoietic stem cells make blood cells, a.k.a. formed elements, okay? And so what you're, what you're seeing here, you guys, is it's basically this process of, of formation all the way until you get to a red blood cell here. And you guys see that along the way, the cell actually exocytoses its nucleus such that the fully formed erythrocyte does not have a nucleus, and it's just full of hemoglobin, okay? So it's kind of a cool process. Can it reverse? Can you go from a red blood cell back? to a hemocytoblast. No, it's one way, right? It's fully committed, unlike humans. Okay, so in terms of how do you regulate the formation of new blood cells, right? So I'll give you guys a, a kind of an interesting question here. If your red blood cells have a lifespan of 90 to 120 days, how does your body know when to replace those or how to replace those, right? It's kind of weird, right? You think, okay, does your body like sense red blood cell count? You know, and then knows, okay, well, if I lose one, i got to replace one. It's actually not doing that either. It's not like counting one for one, right? Like, oh, we lost a red – there's no, like, uh, barcodes on your red blood cells, like, you know, like where, like, if you lose one red blood cell, your body's got an inventory of all of them and, like, oh, we lost that one. Better make a new one, right? That doesn't exist. The only stimulus to make new red blood cells is O2 levels in your blood. So the stimulus for erythropoiesis is hypoxia which means low O2, right? So if you have not enough red blood cells, then your O2 level is going to be low, and your kidneys have O2 sensors in them, and they release a hormone in response to that, right? So <clears throat> that's kind of cool. Now, there are hormonal controls, but you also need adequate supplies of different nutrients like iron, protein, carbohydrates to even make those new cells, right? So we're saying about, on average, about 2 million red blood cells are made every second. And that's just about enough to replace the amount of red blood cells you lose every second. So if your red blood cell production matches the destruction, then your concentrations won't change. But if your red blood cell production is greater than destruction, then over time you're going to get more and more red blood cells in your blood, right? And that could be a bad thing because your blood could become more viscous. So you don't want it to become too viscous. So uh, the stimulus then for, to make new red blood cells is tissue hypoxia, which means you only make new red blood cells when you don't have enough O2 in the blood. So it only goes one way. It's more like, it's more like your O2 levels decline, and once you get to a certain point, then, you're, then you start making new red blood cells, right? But then those start to die off, and your O2 levels decline. You get to a certain point, you start making new red blood cells, right? 
And so <clears throat> that hormone that, that, that actually is the control of, of red blood cell production is called erythropoietin or EPO. Okay? So erythropoietin is a hormone that's released by your kidneys and it stimulates your red bone marrow to make more red blood cells. But EPO is only released when your O2 levels are low and your kidneys can sense this, right? So what do you guys think this means for people with kidney failure? If their kidneys are failing and they can't actually secrete EPO, what's going to happen inside their body then over time? Yeah, they're going to lose their red blood cells, right? So you're saying that one of the consequences of kidney failure, very good, <clears throat> is that if you don't release EPO because your kidneys are failing, you're eventually going to get what we call renal anemia. And it's anemia because your kidneys aren't stimulating your red bone marrow to make red blood cells anymore. Now, you can give people artificial EPO, though. They do this sometimes. Like, if, let's say if you've had a bone marrow transplant and, um, you know, you got to make sure that they're really ramping up their production of red blood cells. You know, you can, you can inject them with, with EPO or erythropoietin, right? This is also one of the blood doping drugs that people take. Like, why, if you're an athlete, why would you want to inject EPO into your body? More red blood cells. Yeah, exactly. Which means you have more hemoglobin, which means you can transport more oxygen, which means you can probably supply more oxygen to your tissues, which means you can have less fatigue, right? So you can actually have better endurance. But what's the other trade-off of that, you guys? More red blood cells, your blood is going to be more viscous, more sticky, right? Now, if you're a trained athlete, it's probably not a big deal because your heart's already pretty strong, so you can deal with that extra resistance. But if you're not a trained athlete and your heart's not as strong because you're not conditioned for that, that could become a pro more of a problem for you. So it's kind of interesting. Cool. So if you guys look here, this, this process of feedback, we say it's a balance. So if your O2 levels get too low, the kidneys release erythropoietin, which stimulates your red bone marrow to make new red blood cells, and it gets you back to normal homeostatic levels for O2. So it's pretty awesome. So in terms of dietary requirements for production of red blood cells, you guys, first of all, we have to have enough, um, enough amino acids, lipids, and carbs so that, you know, if someone is nutrient deprived, like with marasmus, where they're just not getting enough nutrients or calories, then what you're going to find then is that they also might end up getting anemia. So one of the consequences of certain types of eating disorders could also be anemia because you need adequate nutrient supply here. Um, you also need enough iron, right? So most of the iron that's in your body is locked up in the hemoglobin of your blood. So, and the rest of that's going to be stored like in your liver and your spleen, as well as along your digestive tract. It's, you also find it in certain enzymes throughout the cells of your body, but it's mostly in your red blood cells. Now, free iron is actually toxic to your body. So your cells are not that good at storing iron, because if they did, it could actually, you know, damage those cells. So for the most part, you just have enough iron for what your body needs. If you store too much, it can become toxic to you. In fact, there are certain diseases where they have iron storage diseases, where their body holds on to iron too well, and it ends up leading to multi-system organ failure. Like it affects every organ system because the free iron is toxic, right? Now, uh, that means we also need enough dietary iron and to be able to absorb the iron as well. So, you know, you get a lot of iron like in meats, you know, red meat has a lot of iron because it's got, you know, myoglobin, which has iron in it, right? Um, <clears throat> you also find a lot of iron in leafy greens as well, but the iron that's in leafy greens is inside of the, the cell, the cell walls, and we don't have cellulase enzyme to get, you know, those cells to break open. So you get less sort of absorbable iron from leafy greens than as you would for meat. Um, but obviously you can't just live on meat. That's not healthy for your body. So <laughs> um, now we also need vitamin B12 to build it and uh, make new DNA. Because remember the cell, even though red blood cells don't have a nucleus, there's still many cells that have to divide to make a red blood cell. So that means you need DNA synthesis. So vitamin B12 and folic acid are necessary for, vitamin, for DNA synthesis. You guys remember intrinsic factor, which was made by your stomach, was necessary for vitamin B12 absorption. So that if you have like stomach disease, maybe like gastric ulcers or chronic irritation, or maybe you've had your stomach removed, you're going to have pretty poor vitamin B12 absorption then, right? And that could eventually lead to anemia because you need that to make new cells, okay? So it's kind of interesting. So if you look at this process of the cycle of red blood cells here, you guys, we say that um, your kidneys can sense O2 content. And if your O2 levels are low because you don't have enough red blood cells, the kidneys can release the hormone erythropoietin, which then travels on over to blood marrow, I'm sorry, to red bone marrow, 
and it stimulates red bone marrow to make new red blood cells. And so that those red blood cells enter the bloodstream, and then they live for about 90 to 120 days, which is three or four months, right? That's on average, by the way. It could be more or less, depending on how your red blood cells are formed, if they're healthy, and if you have some kind of red blood cell defect for maybe some, like a genetic disease, like sickle cell anemia, right? So what we find, you guys, is that to break down and recycle the red blood cells, it involves your liver and your spleen. So your liver and spleen have these very narrow spaces where the red blood cells have to squeeze through. And if they're like an old kind of falling apart red blood cell and they squeeze that, those spaces, sometimes they tear open, they fall apart, right? And that's it. That's the end of that red blood cell's life. And the spleen and liver will gobble up those components and then recycle those components, right? Now, the, the protein components of red blood cells are broken down into amino acids and then put back into the bloodstream. And then uh, what we find, you guys, is that <clears throat> for the heme group of hemoglobin, that's actually converted to bilirubin and then incorporated into bile, which gives bile its green color. And that's actually part of the emulsification process. Now, some of this bilirubin is actually recycled by your small intestine. So you can absorb some of that bilirubin back into your bloodstream for reuse. So you obviously don't lose all that bilirubin into feces. But the reason why your feces aren't green is that that bilirubin is usually converted to stercobilin by the bacteria of your gut. So that the reason why a poop is kind of brown is that the bilirubin is now stercobilin, which has a brownish color, which is interesting. But what if your feces are really green? What does that, what does that tell you? Lots of bile in the feces, right, exactly. Or a lot of bilirubin for whatever reason. Or maybe, uh, you know, you don't have enough bacteria in there, you know, breaking down food so that it's not, you know, uh, able to convert bilirubin to stercobilin, right? So it could, it could indicate maybe like a bacterial gut flora problem as well. Usually, so it's just a lot of bile, right? So usually you're going to see like really kind of greenish looking feces if somebody's eating like a fatty meal. And they've released so much bile that it's overloaded their body, like the, sorry, the bacteria's ability to kind of convert that color. That's why their feces are going to kind of be more greenish. That makes sense. Yeah. Which sounds disgusting, but, you know, it happens. Like, uh, I'll give you guys an example. I was on the way to school here, and I noticed that they just built a Raising Canes off of Parker Road. And I was thinking, man, that sounds kind of good. <laughs> even, though, even though I usually don't really eat that junk, you know? But I was thinking, man, it actually does sound pretty good. But I was thinking, yeah, but just right now, I was thinking, yeah, I feel like if I had that, like, you know, like a bunch of fried food, like that definitely, that definitely would lead to like green feces, right? <laughs> so too much bile, too much bilirubin, which is, which, and you think about where to come from. Well, what's weird then is that that greenish color used to be inside of red blood cells. So it all looked kind of like, you know, the circle of life, you might say. <laughs> so um, to define anemia, we say that it's basically where you have low O2 carrying capacity in blood, right? And it's, it's a sign rather than a disease. So like the signs of anemia uh, clinically would be, you know, low hematocrit, low hemoglobin. In fact, your red blood cells are going to be kind of more clear and less red if they have less hemoglobin. And so um, clinically we define it as your blood O2 levels are so low that you can't support normal metabolism. So some of the symptoms of anemia could be like fatigue, right, where you're feeling tired all the time, or malaise, also just kind of tiredness, right. Um, you know, it can also be accompanied by like low metabolism, which means you're going to feel kind of cold, so cooler body temperature, that kind of stuff. Shortness of breath because you just can't really, you know, ever oxygenate your blood that well. And maybe even chills. Chills not because of fever, though. It would be the chills because your metabolism is so low that your body temperature is low right? Because you don't have enough O2 to keep your metabolism up, okay? So one type of anemia we'll talk about here, you guys, is called sickle cell anemia. And sickle cell anemia is actually a heritable disorder where uh, it's a defect in uh, one of the genes for hemoglobin where it's one difference of one amino acid. That's it. So you have one amino acid difference in this hemoglobin chain. And so what happens, you guys, with the hemoglobin, when this occurs, they take on a crescent shape and this crescent shape eventually gives those cells a sickled shape, right? That's what gives them this kind of C shape here, okay? Now, the C shapes of those red blood cells become sticky because the cells can kind of like clump together then. Instead of having this nice sort of biconcave disc shape, they are this crescent shape, okay? And so these red blood cells can rupture more easily then and also block smaller blood vessels. 
which means that not only can you get ischemia or a lack of blood flow if the blood vessels are blocked, but it can also lead to a lot of pain too. And so you get poor O2 delivery from that. And so what this is showing up here, you guys, is like a normal red blood cell. You get this nice little biconcave disc shape. And then down here is the sickled red blood cell, right? The sickle cell. If you guys notice here, it's a difference of one amino acid, right? So instead of a glutamine, you have a valine here. And so the difference then in that one amino acid in hemoglobin can change the shape of the entire red blood cell. But what's also kind of weird about sickle cell anemia is that the cells only take on this severe sickled shape when they're hypoxic or when O2 levels are low. So people with sickle cell anemia are going to get really bad bouts of the, of the pain and low O2 when they're like exercising or uh, you know, doing anything where their O2 levels are going to get low in their tissues. Because the cells then basically they change shape, they take on that sickled appearance. Now what's also kind of interesting about this disease, you guys, is that it protects you against malaria, right? Because malaria is plasmodium, and it actually is a little microbe that can wiggle into your red blood cells where it feeds on your hemoglobin. It's transmitted by mosquito bites, right? In fact, that's why they call it malaria, because mal means bad area air, right? So malaria means bad air. So people kind of knew that there's something in the air that was giving them this. They didn't know what. They said it was malaria. It was bad air. They were close, right? It was in the air. It was mosquitoes. But they knew it was something in the air, right? Malaria. So uh, mosquito bites would transmit this plasmodium. But if you have sickle cell, it's harder for those parasites to wiggle into that cell because it's a sickled shape and it's kind of more tight so that it's a less hospitable environment for those parasites. So what's kind of interesting, guys, is that if you have sickle cell anemia, it protects against malaria infection, which means that if you live in a, sick, if, if you live in a malarial-prone part of the world and you have sickle cell anemia, you're protected against malaria, which means you're more likely to spread your genes onto the next generation, right? Because maybe your neighbors that didn't have sickle cell died of malaria, whereas you didn't because you have sickle cell anemia, and then you're able to have kids and spread your genes on the next generation, right? And those kids are also more likely to have sickle cell anemia, right? Because it's protective. So what you're saying, you guys, is when you look at the prevalence of sickle cell anemia worldwide, not only does it correlate with malaria in those malarial prone areas because it protects you, but it's essentially evolution, right? You're saying that a certain subset of humans have evolved to protect against malaria, right? Now, it's obviously random, but they actually have a protective advantage against this microbe, which is kind of cool. Now, it's not, as, not to say that sickle cell anemia doesn't cause, like, you know, any kind of stress or trauma to your body, but it at least doesn't kill you necessarily, you know, and it protects against malaria, so it gives you a slight advantage, and that's how evolution works. If you have a slight advantage over, you know, your other genetic counterparts, you know, you have a better fitness, well, guess what? Your genes are more likely to go on to the next generation. That's how it works. And it's kind of interesting, guys, one amino acid difference. It's kind of cool. So you might wonder, well, where do you find the people with a lot of sickle cell anemia? Sub-Saharan Africa and the Mediterranean, because there's a lot of malaria there, right? It's kind of interesting. Cool. So moving on, talk about the leukocytes, guys. Remember, they're the white blood cells. Uh, they make up less than 1% of your total blood volume. Now, if you spin that blood down, you guys, where do you find the white blood cells in spun blood? Which fraction? Buffy coat, exactly. I don't, I don't know why it's called the Buffy coat. I have no idea. Because I always thought, like, because back when... <laughs> Back when I was learning about blood, for some reason I thought Buffy Coat was like Buffy the Vampire Slayer. You know what I mean? And I was thinking, I was trying to find like a good way to make those connections. Like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, they kind of suck blood, you know, they're vampires and all. And, uh, <laughs> and you find white blood cells in this Buffy Coat, which is right in the middle, right? Why not? Okay. So maybe you'll, now you can't forget the word Buffy, right? Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Something to do with blood. <laughs> okay. So, now the function of these white blood cells or leukocytes, you guys, is they're protective, right? So they protect against infection of microbes, whether viruses, plasmodia, you know, like, like malaria, or even bacteria in your blood. And so what's also kind of cool, you guys, is that the circulating white blood cells can also leave the bloodstream and enter your tissues through a process called diapedesis, or also called transcytosis, okay? Actually, no, just diapedesis, Jason, just kidding, right? <laughs> So uh, diapedesis is essentially where these white, white blood cells can leave the bloodstream, squeeze through the blood vessel wall, and enter an infected tissue, right? Let's, let's say if this room is the bloodstream, you know, like, and I'm a white blood cell, I could, like, squeeze through the cells in this wall and then get into the tissue, just like that. <laughs> right? So that's kind of cool. You can kind of squeeze your way through, so it can move through spaces. 
And it actually is, the, the stimulus for this is hemotaxis. Hemo means chemicals, taxis is movement. So these white blood cells are actually attracted to the chemical scent trail, you might say, of things like microbes or inflammation. So that, you know, you might smell like, like if you're a white blood cell, you go, I smell infection, right? And it's out there. So you're actually attracted to that and you start moving towards the infection. <laughs> That's called chemotaxis. So it's kind of interesting. So uh, there's two types of leukocytes. We got the granulocytes and agranulocytes, okay? The reason why the granulocytes are called that is they got visible cytoplasmic granules. And these granules are full of histamine, right? Histamine is an inflammatory molecule we'll talk about later when we get to the inflammation chapter. And then the agranulocytes don't have histamine granules, which means their cytoplasm looks more clear. And by having less granules, they're called agranulocytes, right? So the granulocytes are the neutrophils, eosinophils, and the basophils. And the agranulocytes are the lymphocytes and the monocytes, okay? So if you guys look at where you find these leukocytes in, in whole, I'm sorry, in spun blood, they're in the buffy coat, right? In fact, they're at the bottom of the buffy coat with a platelet set on top closer to the plasma. In fact, even if you could extract those leukocytes from the buffy coat and you can look at the different count of these white blood cells in uh, the solution, what you'd find is the neutrophils are the most abundant, right? So neutrophils account for 50 to 70 percent of all of your leukocytes, followed by the lymphocytes, which are 25 to 45 percent, followed by the monocytes, which are 3 to 8 percent, and then we have the eosinophils and the basophils, which are 2 to 4 and then 0.5 to 1 percent. So pretty rare for eosinophils and basophils, right? Especially in the blood. Now, what's important to note, though, you guys, is that these concentrations can change, or the percentages of these cells can change, depending on the type of infection you might have. So what's interesting is that if you have a parasitic infection, you have way more eosinophils than normal. And the reason being is that eosinophils, one of their functions is to fight against parasitic infections. So if you have a parasite, one of the ways you can identify this, not just measuring if the parasite's present, but if your eosinophil count is elevated, that could suggest parasitic infection. But it also is elevated if you have allergies. So if you have allergies, your eosinophil count is also typically higher, which is interesting. I got an interest, third one for you guys too. That's also interesting. Your eosinophil count increases the more sexual partners you've had in your life. So if you've had more sexual partners, higher eosinophil count. What do you guys think is going on with that? <laughs> it's kind of a weird one, huh? I mean, you couldn't just measure someone's eosinophils by, like, dang, you've been around, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> but they can correlate, right? So, what do you got? Why, if your eosinophils are involved with fighting parasites, and you've had, how can it co correlate with having more sexual partners? I got a question for you guys. What if you're female and uh, your female's immune system is exposed to foreign sperm. How do you think your immune system recognizes that? Do you think it recognizes it as cells of your own body or foreign cells? Foreign cells, you got it, right. So what's interesting is that sperm cells are treated like foreign microorganisms by the immune system. Even Actually, even the male's own immune system, we'll come back to that too. Because sperm cells don't develop until puberty, which means that your immune system is already matured before then, before puberty, so that your, your own male's body recognizes sperm as foreign cells. That's why we have, to, we have to have something called a blood testes barrier to prevent sperm cells from interacting with, with your uh, immune cells. I know, it's crazy stuff, right? We'll come back to that, though. Also think STIs, right? STIs are like parasites. So again, if you've had more sexual partners, you, you have a higher risk of being exposed to more STIs. Not, not the ones that are necessarily like, you know, you need to like go out and get treated for, but... One of the ones that most humans on Earth has is human papillomavirus or HPV, right? Even if you think you've never had genital warts before, right, where like maybe there's like never been like a wart there, most humans on Earth have at least one HPV infection, right? Or at least one virus that's that's present, which is interesting. It's something like 98% of humans, right? So it's kind of fascinating. There's some of those that are associated though with cancer. That's why we have a vaccine against just those forms, because if you if you have infection with those forms of HPV. It puts you at a higher risk for uh, like cervical cancer, which is interesting. Yeah. All right. So maybe we'll, again, we'll come back to that later. So uh, with the granulocytes, you guys, they're larger and shorter lived. They have lobe nuclei. 
The cytoplasmic granules are full of histamine. They stain with what's called a right stain. And they're all phagocytic to some degree, which means they can all kind of engulf microbes a little bit. Okay? So we'll start out with the neutrophils. right? So the neutrophils are the most numerous of the white blood cells. They, they have cytoplasmic granules that stain uh, lilac. So it's kind of red here. right? And then um, three to six lobes of nuclei. So one of the ways to identify neutrophil guys is they're multi-lobed. Right? And they're very phagocytic. In fact, we call these the bacterial slayers of your body, right? Because uh, they're actually part of one of the first lines of defense for your immune system. So one of the first cells that comes in and fights an infection are the neutrophils. In fact, when you find uh, inflammation or infection in tissue, usually what accompanies that is something called neutrophilia, where the neutrophils, they crowd in, right? They kind of mobilize and they start, they start to try to fight off that infection. In fact, neutrophils are also one of the components of pus, so pus, or this purulent discharge, right, we say is full of water, an exudate, and dead neutrophils, or, or even living neutrophils, okay? Because again, you guys, they're, they're the bacterial slayers. They're the ones that are going to come in first and just start fighting off those bacteria, okay? Now, the eosinophils are pretty rare, you guys remember? They're the second least abundant of all of these. And they're mostly involved with helping to fight off parasitic infections, how many parasitic infections do you guys think that like people in the U.S. are going to be exposed to? Do we have a lot of parasites here? Not really. No, I know. So what's weird is that we have a special cell type that's adapted for an environment that we no longer live in, right? Like maybe at some point, you know, you know, our ancestors lived in an in a area of the world where there were a lot of parasites, right? And so eosinophils had a more important purpose then, right? Now, if we, we don't have as many parasites... These cells don't have a job so much, right? Unless you do get a parasitic infection. Obviously, they're there. So what's kind of interesting too, guys, is that these eosinophils are also associated with allergies, right? And, and um, if you – there's an interesting phenomenon, you guys, is that you find higher rates of allergy where areas where there's low parasites. So you find more allergies in parts of the world where there are fewer parasites. The idea being that these eosinophils are bored. And you start like, you know, overreacting to molecules because eosinophils aren't able to really do what they're meant to do, if that makes sense, which is kind of interesting. So what's also kind of interesting to you guys is that uh, one of the ways to treat allergies is to actually be infected with a parasite. So if you, let's say if you have a really severe allergy, like, uh, like hay fever, which would be like, which, which correlates with asthma, like uh, pollen allergy. If you get a parasitic infection, your allergy pretty much goes away. Because now your eosinophils are more focused on the, on the parasite, not the you know, pollen that, that doesn't have to do anything to your body, right? And so uh, they actually do this in Brazil where they can treat allergies by infecting you with a, with a parasitic roundworm. And so obviously you would do this not for like any run-of-the-mill allergy, you know. It would be something that's a little bit more life-threatening uh, and debilitating, but it works, which is kind of cool. And so uh, what, what they're trying to do now here in the U.S. is not get a parasite to infect you, but rather... Um, simulate what it's like to have a parasitic infection without actually having to infect you, right? Kind of like a vaccine, you know, where you kind of simulate an infection without having to actually be infected by polio. You can just get a polio vaccine, you know, that kind of thing. So, and that could actually help treat allergies, which is going to be amazing. When they can figure that out, it's going to be awesome. So, all right, guys. So the basophils, though, uh, these ones don't really have a very visible nucleus. They're just full of histamine granules, that's why there's all these little dots in there in the cell. And so they release a lot of these inflammatory mediators that not only attract other immune cells, but also act in the inf inflammatory response. So they actually help to cause vasodilation, they increase blood flow, and we'll go through the phases of inflammation later. And so they're very similar to mast cells, which are like the local um, you know, basophils, but they're the rarest, right? So that, that the, the least abundant. They're the 0.5 to 1% of all of your leukocytes. So the A granulocytes are called this, you guys, because they lack visible cytoplasmic granules. They have a spherical or kidney shape. And so the, the most abundant of the A granulocytes is called the lymphocyte. Now remember, this was the second most abundant of all the leukocytes, right? The lymphocyte. Lymphocytes are part of your adaptive immune response. They're B cells and T cells, okay? There's a third one called a natural killer cell, which is actually part of your innate immune response. But again, we'll come back to this when we get to the, um, the infection chapter, or uh, the uh, immunity chapter, rather. And so <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, they're mostly in lymphoid tissue, like your lymph nodes, your spleen, your tonsils, pyrus patches in your intestine, that kind of stuff. Some of these can circulate in blood, but you mostly find them in lymph, which makes sense. Lymphocytes, lymphatic tissues, okay? So you have T cells and B cells, and we'll come back to these later, you guys. But the T cells are mostly going to be good at fighting like tumor cells and viruses, and the B cells produce antibodies, which are the little molecular flags that can stick onto foreign antigens and cause clumping. And then the monocytes are circulating macrophages, right? So what monocytes do as the largest leukocyte is they can circulate in the bloodstream, and once they get activated by chemical mediators like histamine, these monocytes can leave the bloodstream, enter the infected tissue, get larger, and then become a macrophage. So they circulate in their inactive form as a monocyte, but really a monocyte is the same thing as a macrophage that's just inactive. So that these things can leave, enter in a tissue, and they can start to engulf any kind of debris or microorganisms that may be in that tissue. Okay? Um, so these ones, are, these ones play a very important role with tuberculosis, right? So TB, um, you know, it mostly infects the lung, but it can spread to other organs like bone as well, as well as muscle. But uh, monocytes, which become macrophages, are the primary immune cell to target TB. And this is also what allows you to kind of like wall off TB in these little, in these little spaces in your lung called uh, gonfoci, which is a little, a little sphere of uh, caseous necrosis. And we'll come back to this in pathophysiology. So uh, leukopoiesis here, you guys, uh, you know, it's the process of producing new white blood cells. And so it's stimulated by chemical mediators. So what's interesting, you guys, is we have like interleukins and tumor necrosis factors and colony stimulating factors. They're released by immune cells during inflammation and infection, and they basically are like signals to get more immune cells. It's almost like rallying the troops, right? So think of these uh, chemical messages. You know, it's almost like being like, it's like almost like a little trumpet, like the, you know, it's like sending out the signal and you're getting more, <laughs> you're getting more white blood cells that are being produced and they're going towards, you know, the battle, the infection. And so it's the signal to recruit more, the production of more white blood cells. How long do these white blood cells last, by the way? You guys remember? On average? Are they longer or shorter than red blood cells? Shorter, yeah, which is weird. We're saying many of these are days, you guys. Like the neutrophils are days. Of, uh, they don't live very long at all. Okay? So, but if you're going to make more, you've got to stimulate more of them to be produced, which is stimulated by these interleukins and colony stimulating factors. So if you guys look at the process of forming white blood cells, like the red blood cell, it all comes from the hemocytoblasts, right? So hemocytoblasts are the stem cell that can make any blood cell, and they can turn into the myeloid line and the lymphoid stem cell line. The lymphoid stem cell line gives rise to all the lymphocytes, like your T cells and your B cells, and your natural killer cells. And your myeloid stem cell line gives rise to everything else, the monocytes, the eosinophils, the basophils, and the neutrophils, right? The reason why we want to know this is that when you, when you start talking about leukemias versus lymphomas, we also want to differentiate, well, are they cells that came from the lymphoid stem cell line or the myeloid stem cell line? So I'll give you guys an example. Um, so you have chronic myelocytic leukemia, which means that they're cells of the myeloid line. Or you can have chronic lymphocytic leukemia, which means they're cells of the lymphoid stem cell line. And so it's a blood cancer, right? But we're, we're defining it based on where the cells come from. That also helps determine the clinical outcomes and how you treat those diseases, right? So what you really want to take away from this particular flowchart are not all the intermediates, but rather the myeloid stem cell line gives rise to your eosinophils, basophils, neutrophils, and monocytes. And your lymphoid stem cell line gives rise to the lymphocytes, like your B cells, T cells, and unfortunately what's not up here, but should be, also natural killer cells, okay? All right, so remember platelets were involved with blood clotting. And we said that to form a blood clot required in part these platelets, which are called thrombocytes. Now, why don't we call it a thrombocyte anymore, do you remember? So why do we get rid of that kind of, that vernacular, thrombocyte? They're not a true cell, right? So it's kind of a misnomer to call them a site because they're not a true cell. So in anatomy, we call them platelets. Clinically, they still call them thrombocytes, though. Okay, so just kind of keep that in mind. So uh, they come from a type of cell called the megakaryocytes. And this cell type is a gigantic cell. That's why it's called mega. 
And it has all these like extensions that stick out. And these pieces can kind of fragment off of those extensions. And the pieces that butt off from the megakaryocyte, they become the platelet. So platelets are like little pieces of the cell that pinch off and you know kind of drift away from the cell into the bloodstream. So platelets aren't a true cell because they really don't have any organelles. They're just fragments of cells that they do have a cytoskeleton though, and their cytoskeleton's made of actin. Remember, actin you find in muscle for contraction, so platelets can contract too, and we'll come back to that here in a minute. But platelets are mostly full of clotting factors, things like serotonin, ADP, calcium, platelet-derived growth factor, you know, these things that promote clotting, okay? Now, normally you find 150 to 400,000 platelets in every middle of blood, which is pretty phenomenal. That's a lot of platelets, okay? So if you guys look here, the megakaryocyte, remember, it also comes from the hemocytoblast, specifically the myeloid stem cell line. So megakaryocytes are a myeloid cell, okay? And these things also produce a tremendous amount of platelets. And so the way this works is they kind of butt off from the main cell itself, which is really interesting. So this is going to lead us into our discussion of hemostasis or blood clotting, okay? So it's a fast series of reactions that basically are involved with to stop bleeding. So hemostasis is the formation of a blood clot, and it occurs in three kind of key phases here, right? We get vascular spasm, platelet plug, followed by coagulation. And so the way this starts is that when a blood vessel tears or ruptures, and it has a hole now, and blood has a potential to leak out, the first thing that happens is the smooth muscle in the wall of that blood vessel starts to spasm. So it starts to, okay? So you get the vascular spasm, okay? And the reason why you get a vascular spasm is it makes turbulent blood, and by having turbulent blood, it gets those platelets to swirl around too and stick inside of that ruptured wall of the vessel, right? And so the next step then is we get a platelet plug that forms where the platelets stick to the exposed collagen right at the tear. So what's really cool then is we're saying that, you know, your blood vessels are kind of like self-repairing. They can self-stitch in some way. So like what if you tore a piece of your clothing, right? Well, you would need to go in there and like hand stitch it or whatever. And nowadays you just buy new, new clothing because it's so cheap. You don't need to like actually repair clothes for the most part. You know what I mean? <laughs> Like if you get like torn jeans, you go buy new jeans because they're, they're cheap enough to usually where you don't have to fix it, which is kind of weird. Um, but that's different than our own body because if you tear the blood vessel wall, it spasms. Okay? What's the point of spasming out? Why do your blood vessels spaz out, so to speak? <laughs> to make turbulent blood. Good. And that turbulence helps stick those platelets in the, in the torn vessel. But the reason why the platelets stick in the torn vessel is they're actually attracted to the exposed collagen at the tear, right? So right at the place where it's torn and you get these little fibers that are exposed, the platelets go and they start sticking to those fibers, right? And they form a plug right there. And they also stick to each other. So they form a nice little plug right there. Okay, so immediately it already prevents blood loss, okay? The next step is the platelets release clotting factors that promote coagulation, right? Which is the blood clotting cascade. So if you guys look at those three steps here, you guys remember, see the, the blood vessel t is torn here. What's the first step? Vascular spasm, right? It's my favorite step. <laughs> followed by platelet plug, right? So the platelet's sticking there, followed by coagulation because the platelets release clotting factors. Actually, so does the damaged tissue too, by the way. So the damaged tissue releases clotting factors and it promotes the formation of this clot or coagulation. So the way this works, you guys, is there's three phases of coagulation. And the first thing you need is something called prothrombin activator. So prothrombin activator is formed by both pathways. We have extrinsic and intrinsic pathways. Prothrombin activator converts prothrombin into thrombin. And then thrombin is an enzyme that converts fibrinogen into fibrin. Do you guys remember, where'd you find fibrinogen? It's in the plasma, right? Now, if, it's o if it ends in ogen, what does that mean? It's inactive. Good. So what thrombin does is it converts fibrinogen into the active form, which is fibrin. Now you get those fibers that can kind of spread out there, right? So what this looks like, you guys, is that the extrinsic pathway are where clotting factors are released by the damaged tissue. And then the intrinsic pa pathway is where clotting factors are released by the platelets. So the damaged tissue releases clotting factors that lead to the production of something called factor 10. And then the intrinsic pathway also can lead 
which is released by platelets, can also lead to the, the production of factor 10. Now factor 10 is prothrombinase. Prothrombinase is the prothrombin activator. Okay? And so that converts prothrombin into thrombin. Thrombin is an enzyme that converts fibrinogen into fibrin, and then fibrin is the basically the protein mesh that helps to trap platelets, red blood cells, and just debris in the blood, and it actually solidifies that blood into the clot, right? So to get the blood clot or coagulation, you need to have fibrin produced. So it makes sense why you want to have two different pathways because you wouldn't want to have blood clots just form randomly. So you want to have two different corroborating stories, like the tissue saying it's damaged, the platelets are saying it's damaged, and together they lead to the production of a fibrin clot. And if you only have one, it doesn't work so well at all, actually. And so you need to have both. Two stories, right? Damaged tissue and the platelets are saying, we both have damage, let's get a clot, right? And so you get the formation of fibrin there. Okay. So this is actually what it looks like under a microscope, which is pretty cool, you guys. So all this is these, these fibrin protein strands, and they're trapping the red blood cells in there. And for whatever reason, to me, this kind of looks like Spider-Man, like something Spider-Man would do, you know, like just spraying a bunch of fibrin on there. It's just trapping, you know, red blood cells, forming a clot and saving the day. You know, why not? <laughs> so the next step here, guys, and we'll wrap up here, is this idea of clot retraction. So remember, remember I was saying that platelets have actin filaments in them, okay? Actin is involved with contraction. So when the platelets form that plug and they start releasing clotting factors, the next step is they actually start to contract. And as they contract, they're pulling the edges of the tissue closer together, right? Because they're in the, the torn area. So the plug all contracts and it pulls the edges of that tissue closer together. This does two things. First of all, it decreases healing time, right? Which means you heal faster because... By bringing the, the edges of the tissue closer together, there's less tissue you have to repair or replace there, right? And by squeezing out the serum and clotting factors from the clot, you effectively can prevent the clot from getting any bigger. That way, the clot only gets as big as it needs to be, and so you don't just keep clotting up your blood forever, right? And so it draws the ruptured vessels closer together, which helps to, you know, improve healing time and squeezes serum from the clot, so it stops the clot from growing, right? So it's positive feedback to a point, but then once you squeeze the serum out through clot retraction, uh, then it stops the clot from even growing any further. And by the way, this was just discovered like in the 80s. So it's kind of amazing. That was not long ago, right? And so, um, you know, it's kind of cool. Like you're just continually discovering new things about the body, which is pretty, 